Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back for another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Since I last interviewed him for the first time, the gold price has rallied enormously. It's up over $500 an ounce when we're recording this interview on Wednesday, July 17th, 2024. The gold price is up above $2,450, although there was a little bit of a paper price smash today. The silver price is still hovering a little bit above $30 at $30.24. I think it was above $31 only yesterday or the day before. Since 1993, he has written the oldest and most widely read gold stock newsletter. Brian London, thank you for joining me. Great to be with you, Jason. And so, Brian, we're recording this interview, like I said, on Wednesday, July 17th, 2024. I want to get your thoughts on what you think has driven this large uh, price spike in the gold price, in the U.S. dollar gold, gold price, because obviously the gold price, as we've discussed in our prior interviews, The uh, gold and silver prices were much higher in other currencies, especially Asian currencies, uh, prior to this rally in the U.S. dollar gold price. Why do you think there's been a huge spike in the gold price since March? Well, the first leg of this bull market, this new bull market, was driven by central bank demand, primarily People's Bank of China buying and domestic demand in China. Domestic Chinese were buying gold because they uh, they didn't have much of an option at the real estate markets in China and the stock markets in China in the dumps. So they turned to gold and unusually and actually in an unprecedented fashion, they they actually bought more as the price went up. Typically and previously, Chinese investors and Asian investors in general bought on price declines. They were uh, exhibiting bargaining behavior. Uh, but this time, uh, Chinese investors and savers were buying on the way up, something that the Western investors had previously done. And on that note, however, the Western investors were standing aside and not buying gold during the, the first leg of this bull market because they really didn't understand what was driving the price, or they they felt like these factors could reverse at any time, and 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 they they were really wanting to bet on the original driver that they thought was going to be uh, occurring this year, being a Fed pivot. Now we're in the uh, unique place over the last few weeks, in that some softening economic data in the U.S. and softening rhetoric from the uh, the Fed officials has led the markets to start pricing in the Fed pivot sometime probably starting in September. So right now we have the Western investors coming into gold. And I don't think that the, the Eastern investors have abandoned the market at this point. The bottom line is it's, it's a potentially very explosive situation which in the history of gold as an investing asset, I think is unprecedented that we may have both big segments of gold demand, the East and the West coming into the market at the same time. That could result in uh, really extraordinary price action going forward. And for our listeners out there, Brian also hosts the famous New Orleans Gold Conference for a couple decades now. It's probably the top gold conference. He gets a lot of the big name experts there. I believe it's in October or normally it's in October for our listeners who want to check that out on his website. But in terms of like the, the gold demand, I think this time it might be different. You brought up how uh, Chinese buyers and Asian buyers normally are very price sensitive. They don't want to chase the price higher. When the price starts to go up, they stop buying. The reason I think that this time is different is because the Fed has kept interest rates this high. And then you're looking at currencies on a relative basis. The dollar has been relatively strong. Then you go and look at these Asian currencies like the Japanese yen, the Korean won, other Asian currencies, and they've been very, very weak against the dollar. If you're an Asian investor and you see your purchasing power being destroyed, you're going to want to go get some type of hedge with uh, physical gold, physical silver, maybe Bitcoin, especially if you're a Chinese retail investor and you see that your real estate investments are not doing well there, too. Yeah, there's a cultural affinity for gold in Asia generally, and especially in China, where they use gold as savings. So they're they're prone to use gold, uh, you know, transform their cash holdings to some extent into gold. Uh, because they they understand what happens in inflation and they understand the destruction of their currency's purchasing power. 
What's interesting now is that they're also investing in gold, uh, you know, following that price higher. And and that's something that's that is, again, unprecedented. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the pictures of the people crowding into jewelry shops, gold shops in China, uh, even on price spikes. We, we've seen them go in on price spikes before, but if anything, they were selling at the time even though they have a propensity to, to hold on to their gold holdings. So it really is unusual right now. You know, you, you don't like to use the, the phrase, this time is different in investing. But in reality, there are a number of factors are surrounding this bull run in gold that are, are unique and are different this time. Yeah, I agree. I think we're seeing intentional fiat currency destruction. We're seeing a lot of debt monetization. We're seeing a lot of these central banks and governments, they don't want to cut back on government spending and they're willing to let the real inflation rate, not the, their consumer price index, which is the, the official government inflation rate, but they're willing to let the real inflation rate run hot. So the average citizen on the streets sees that their purchasing power is declining, their bills, their everyday living expenses are going up. In China, we just had, I think back in April, the largest bank withdrawal of cash in Chinese banking system history. So I'm guessing, my educated guess, is that a good amount of those funds that were withdrawn from Chinese banks, they're not going to put the cash under the mattress because a lot of people in China expect a currency devaluation in bank bailouts. There's already been, what, 40 bank bailouts in just the last month? They're smaller banks, though. So, I mean, like, it's not going to collapse the Chinese economy or anything. They just copied what the Federal Reserve Bank did in, in 2008. But if, you, if you're a Chinese citizen and you see these bank bailouts, you're going to want to start to hedge and you're going to want to take your purchasing power, your savings out of the banking system, like you said. And one of the safest ways is what physical gold and physical silver. Yeah. And it doesn't hurt if the what you're buying as your form of savings, your safe haven is increasing in price at a much faster rate than your currency is depreciating. That does nothing to dampen the the fervor. You know, that gets you wanting to buy more because it's working. And uh, and, and that's why I think you're seeing younger uh, people in China buying gold now because it's the latest thing. And, you know, you mentioned how the, the, the cost of living and not the government statistics. The government here in, in the West or in, in the U.S. and specifically – keeps talking about how inflation is falling, but in the public's mind, they think of what's happened to prices over the past three years or so. They're not looking at the, the monthly statistics or even the, the yearly statistics. They know that everything is a lot more expensive now than it was three years ago. And they feel, they believe that in three years, prices will be much higher than they are now. The only way to really protect yourself, the proven way to protect yourself, is by buying gold and silver. And that that understanding, that view is spreading right now, I believe. And then you add that to the consistent monthly dollar cost averaging from the non-G7 central banks. Although, Brian, the Chinese uh, government and the uh, People's Bank of China, their central bank, claims that they're going to stop buying gold. But do you actually trust them? Do you, do you think that they'd tip their hand for free at in public that they're going to say, oh, we're not going to buy any gold and then actually do what they said in public for free, tip their hand for free? Well, they certainly have no problem in uh, shading the truth or, or outright lying. What I was more... Uh, curious about is why they were showing such strong gold purchases earlier in the year when it was obviously dropping the price up. Now, they have may, may have been buying for years and years on a regular basis and hiding that as well and just thought it was an opportune time to, to let the world know. Um, but I, I think that they have pulled back because the price has truly spiked over recent months. And there's a good chance they have either pulled back or at the very least aren't saying anything because they don't want to throw gasoline on the fire. Um, if you look at, at gold's composition as central bank holdings, central bank reserves around the world, you'll see that they it just recently surpassed the euro on average as uh, the second top holding in central bank reserves. Concurrently, the the percentage ranking of the dollar is dropping while gold is rising. They're still pretty far apart, and I don't think those lines will cross in the near future, but I think they will eventually. Um, and, and the bottom line is, you see, 
not just central banks, but deep pockets, big money around the world are shifting allocations toward gold, whether that's because they're following a trend, whether that's because they're predicting further depreciation of their currencies, whether they're simply looking for more insulation from from U.S. dollar weaponization, uh, it's it's a growing trend. And it doesn't have to move that much because gold is, gold and mining equities as well, are such small markets relative to these massive pools of capital that are sloshing around the world. It doesn't take much of a shift, just fractions of a percentage point toward gold to have a tremendous effect on the price of the metals. I think I saw a recent chart. I'm not sure if you've seen the same one, but it said that like managed money, so institutional investors, pension funds, their total asset exposure to commodities and gold is below 1%. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's. Uh, I've seen the same charts. And typically at the, the peak of a uh, bull market, um, it's closer to 4 to 5%. So there's a lot of room to move. Now, for silver demand, are we seeing large silver demand spike for industrial for solar too? Well, it's growing. I've seen projections that within uh, ten years, the uh, silver demand for solar will take up all new supplies of silver, um, which is, you know, significant. Now, I have never been a big a uh, fan or advocate of the argument that silver's industrial demand has a large effect on its price. I think it's monetary demand that really drives the price for silver. And typically analysts use its industrial demand merely as a stick to, to hit it with. You know, if there's forecasting a slowdown in China or or anywhere else or a recession in the U.S., then they'll they'll use that as an excuse to sell silver because of its industrial usages. But in fact, those industrial usages have very little to do, in my opinion, with the current price of silver. I think they're going to grow over time, particularly from solar to where they will have an effect. But currently, it, it's it's really not a big factor in in the pricing of silver in my mind. Okay, because China and India, their solar um, panel usage has just exploded. I think India imported more physical silver in the last uh, five or six months than they did for all of 2023. I don't know, uh, breaking that down for the silver imports, how much percentage will actually be used for industrial demand, for electronics, and for solar panels. But China just brought the world's largest solar farm online, I think, out there near the Gobi Desert. And I'm guessing that the, a lot of those solar panels, they have to be replaced every couple of years because of the harsh conditions. And I'm not sure how efficient the recycling is going to be for all that silver. Yeah. And like I say, it's, it is growing and, um, and I think it will have an effect at some point in time, but there, there are a lot of other factors in silver, like 70% of uh, silver production is as a byproduct of other metals. So supply constraints, demand constraints, don't really affect it as much. It's it's price inelastic to some degree, and okay. uh, and that's also an advantage in that the price can increase and it won't uh, drive further uh, supplies that much either. But okay. it's, keep in mind when you're you're trying to analyze supply and demand for silver. And in general, I don't think supply demand statistics for silver or or gold are the primary drivers of their prices. Okay, so for annual silver supply, you're saying that the majority of annual silver supply is what as a byproduct for uh, copper mines or gold mines or lead and zinc yeah. mines then? Yeah, about 70%. Okay, so if the copper price stays relatively high, I mean, there could be potentially more silver mm -hmm. brought online, except that we're going to discuss later in the interviews. It seems a lot of policies in Latin America where a lot of those copper deposits are, they're going to be potentially either delaying permits for years for open pit mining for copper for copper and gold mines with silver byproduct or banning the mi open pit mines outright. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's a broader story for all metals is the supply constraints. It's hard to bring new mines online. It's only becoming more difficult with permitting and uh, environmental uh, permitting, et cetera. So it, it it really is a tough business. And a lot of the goals that we currently have 
for electrification and et cetera are unachievable. Um, but they're still going to try, and it's going to place really uh, hot, great pressure on on supplies and prices for for metals across the board. Yeah. So to add to your points, there, Chile is considered the Saudi Arabia of copper. They own Cadelco, which is a state-run copper mining giant, and then there's also private sector mining companies there for copper mines too. But I believe Chilean copper production is collapsing for the la- <clears throat> excuse me, Chilean copper production is collapsing for the last like five to seven years. I think the same story is true also for what Peru, Mexico, uh, Panama. You have Cobre Panama that's just in the last twelve or so months. Right. But in general, like the trend for a lot of the copper supply is trending downward for a bunch of different reasons, whether that's cost or grades, uh, royalty taxes, or just like environmental permitting issues there that they don't want and what you're saying that that will also affect silver supply then yeah it will and keep in mind as well that what we've noticed what we've seen over many years many cycles is that as prices rise then governments try to uh to get more of the pie they they change the deal with mining companies in some cases they nationalize mines so um every step along the way these uh, these impediments arise to curtail supply. Uh, well, high prices, well, look at Cobre Panama, a of it, but it's still a difficult path. Well, look at Cobre Panama. Wasn't that over one percent of the annual copper supply? Yeah, yeah. Politics get uh, get involved in these things, and uh, you know, politicians don't necessarily care about the the lively, livelihood or welfare of their constituents. Um, and who knows what was behind that ultimately, but that's, that's the sort of thing that happens and it's going to be repeated over and over again. Well, I, I would argue that, that, uh, it's unintended consequences because it's definitely hurt the Panamanian economy. You're not going to see investment by the mining companies into expanding property, plant equipment, exploration, drilling, expanding the mill, and then that's losing jobs and tax revenue. So, so the mine is shut down. I mean, and then Franco Nevada and the other, the main mining company are going to be suing the Panamanian government in, um, what an international arbitration court or something. Yeah, absolutely. It, it will keep other mining companies and projects out of Panama. And, you know, you're not going to get any uranium mines developed in Niger anytime soon. And it's just a cycle that repeats itself and repeats itself. Now, each time a new regime comes in, they try to smooth things over and they say this time is different. And then mining comes back, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a cycle that, you know, runs over every 10 years or so in, in a lot of these companies or countries. rather. So we have the second quarter earnings for 2024 coming up for the gold miners. Do you expect robust margins and free cash flow? Or do you think that the industry is still dealing with these long-term trends of rising input costs like labor costs, cost of capital, energy costs, and falling ore grades? Yeah, the, the costs are rising. But the the really exciting thing now is that over the last quarter, the metals prices, at least gold and silver, have risen much more quickly than mining costs. Barrick just came out of his quarterly numbers today, and, and its costs were some ranging from zero to two percent across the board. It, the primary uh, rise in its costs were higher royalty payments due to higher metals prices. That's the kind of problem you want to have, frankly. So the, the miners are, have known this for months, that their margins are expanding much more quickly than well, they are expanding as metals prices are rising much more quickly than their costs. So I think that we're, we're going to start seeing now is more uh, M&A from the big miners. And maybe we'll see that kind of, you know, uh, bidding fever, buying fever that we were hoping we were going to see for the juniors. OK, so you think then that like a Newmont mining or a Barrick Gold or a mid-tier gold miner will go out and buy a near-term project that's permitted and maybe just needs the funding to start construction? Or do you think that we're going to see mergers where um, a mid-tier gold miner or a larger senior miner goes and buys a uh, one asset producer? Well, you can see anything, really. Um, but right now, you know, we, we just saw a, um, a $750 million package, financing package for Solgold uh, with Franco Nevada and Cisco. Now that 
that's more of the royalty companies coming in and getting gold streams, et cetera, to finance uh, a big project. But I think what we're seeing is that they're, they're willing to step up now, take advantage of this window of opportunity where a lot of these assets need money to advance and are cheap, uh, relatively, you know, historically inexpensive. And yet the metals prices have surged far more than I think anybody was really seriously predicting at this point in the cycle. Yeah, I think we're at a very healthy gold price right now, copper price too. So if metals prices just stay at these levels, and as long as we don't get a huge spike in oil, I think we could see really robust profit margins for at least 12 to 18 months. Like we have a nice little sweet spot here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it just looks good. The, the, the only concern I have is that things may look too good. You know, that naturally I have this contrarian instinct and it looks like the path ahead is really clear. It looks like we're going to have have a, a Fed pivot beginning this fall, probably at the September meeting. Um, so the markets, as I said, are starting to price that in. How far can they go to price that in before the, the actual event? We're going to see. But uh, there's a lot going on in gold and silver right now. There are short positions that are in danger that have to be defended by the powers that be. Uh, and if we have this kind of upward momentum continuing, they're, they're not going to have any, any choice but to cover their shorts and add more fuel to the fire. We have, the again, the, the Eastern investors that have shown no loss of appetite, just as the Western investors are or coming into the market because they can bet on this trend of, of a Fed easing cycle. So it's a real exciting time to be a, a investor in metals and miners, I think. And I was speaking with a friend in, who lives in Hong Kong and listens to the podcast, and he was saying that his friends who are Chinese investors, they don't buy any gold mining stocks. A few of them own Zijin Mining. They don't buy any U.S. or Canadian ones. They mostly just buy physical metal. So uh, we'll see if the Eastern investor starts to diversify into other forms of gold stock investments. In terms of the uh, cost for the industry, do you have the cost for a lot of the gold miners right around fourteen or 1500 an ounce right now? Frankly, that sounds a bit high to me. I, I think we might go $100 less than that. But I really, you know, it, it varies from minor to minor. Um, but I was encouraged by Barrick's numbers. I could get what their ASIC was. But the, the fact that their costs have kind of levelized right now, uh, I find really interesting and, and encouraging. And, you know, what, what really killed the miners in that run up from 2009 to 2011, when the gold price nearly tripled and miners actually underperformed the metal for the first time, what killed them back then was oil going up to $140 a barrel. Right now, we have really fairly steady uh, oil prices, the energy prices in general, and that's the biggest component of OPEX uh, for these big miners. And, uh, and so as long as that's stable, I think margins will continue to expand. Well, back then, other costs were also rising. I think for like the open pit, the the large uh, two ton trucks, like the Caterpillar trucks, the earth movers yeah. that people see, I think the cost for the tires that went from $5,000 a tire replacement, it went up to like twenty or 30000 I mean, some of these yeah. costs, labor costs were up enormously too. So like you said, it wasn't just energy costs and electricity. It was all these input costs were rising faster than metals prices. Rick Roll has talked about this a lot in past interviews. Yeah. Yeah, it takes a lot to keep those big yellow trucks moving. Um, and and yet I think, you know, you'll see goods prices or what have really come back in at least the government measurements of, of inflation. Um, and those things run in cycles. Um, service costs are still rising and have always been rising at over well over 2% uh, for years. It's been the goods prices in in. While those have come back, I think, you know, those pressures that we were talking about earlier that where supply cannot respond quickly, in some cases, if at all, to these new demand pressures, those will reignite those goods prices going forward. But for now, it's I, I think we're in kind of a sweet spot for the miners. The, the worst of those inflationary pressures are behind them, probably temporarily, but for a quarter or two those margins are going to be really nice. And, 
you know, that could ignite that kind of M&A firestorm that we've all, all been hoping for. Especially because a lot of the gold miners don't have a bunch of debt on the balance sheet. And so they do have free cash flow. Like you said, I mean, the their free cash flow margins could be over $800 an ounce, some of them even $1,000 an ounce free cash flow. So that's a lot of free cash flow to either grow your dividend, uh, buy back shares if you think your stock is cheap, or go and do some acquisitions. Yeah, totally agree. Another thing I think that will potentially start to restrict supply is what we're seeing the last like six to seven months. We've had some very serious, uh, uh, very serious accidents with these heap leach pads at some of the mines, whether that was SSR mining at the Chopler mine, the copper, the copper and gold uh, open pit heap leaching operation in Turkey or Victoria Gold's uh, heap leach pad operation in Canada. Do you think that those will make the permitting process even more difficult and further restrict supply? Yeah, I think they obviously will, and uh, government will be taking a much harder look at those projects specifically and generally heap leaching projects. There were some uh, not unique but but, but uh, shared circumstances in those mines, and and when you have these pads where you have uh, a very a relatively fine grind. And you have water in, uh, getting into the material, it can become almost a slurry, which really increases the pressures on tailing dams and the like, uh, finds any weaknesses in those dams, and I, I guess in some cases has increased the pressures beyond the engineered tolerances. So uh, that's something that I think will be considered and reconsidered and permitting in the future. And you may have some re-engineering going on at some projects. Yeah, SSR, I think, is looking at a $300 million estimated cost for fines from the government, environmental cleanup fees, reclamation, and other uh, stuff. That's their current estimate. Now, maybe that $300 million changes, but that was 40% of their annual revenues. And then um, the bad news for Victoria Gold, they're a one asset producer, which means that the management team at Victoria Gold had to bet the whole company on the one mine there. And it was going, um, I think, okay for a while. But um, in their last press release updating the heap leach pad, I mean, that the last sentence in the press release said that like their creditors were calling in defaults on the loan. So I, I don't know how much longer their equity is going to exist, but um, you know, maybe a larger gold miner uh, buys the company out of bankruptcy, restructures things and takes over the mine. Yeah, and, and benefits from the infrastructure there. There is a very significant amount of gold that's that's in those tailings right now that's on the pit right now. Um, so, you know, that, that will probably get recovered by someone somehow. Well, if I remember correctly, Osisco Gold Royalty did a royalty deal with them back in like 2018 or 2019, and they thought that the mine could run for decades but obviously it's only run for what, six or seven years before this heap leach pad accident. I don't know if they tried to like cut corners on the construction costs or what we'll find that out in the coming months for investigation, but thankfully no one died like in the, um, in the heap leach pad accident in Turkey. Yeah. But um, it's, uh, I guess for the royalty company, I guess like, you know, they, they lose the cash flow from the one royalty there, but the company survives. So, uh, that's the best thing about the royalty business model is diversification. They don't have to bet the whole company on uh, one mine. Right. Yeah, and that's why they trade at a, uh, I think, a well-deserved premium. So, do you think the royalty companies are like some of the safest ways to get exposure for gold and silver outside of buying physical metal? Yes, but as I said, uh, you know, they do trade tend to trade at a premium. Uh, so that's priced in to the market to some degree. That added degree of safety, that added degree of of uh, margin for those companies because they they don't have the the operating costs of of a miner. Uh, that is priced in to some extent. Now there are some junior royalties that have popped up over the last decade. There um, that are not trading at. at say, the rich multiples that the, the big boys are. In those cases, I think it's important to find uh, royalty companies that are either in cash flow or near cash flow, very near cash flow, and have some differentiating factor, something that separates them from the pack and adds 
an accretive advantage uh, to some degree. Um, so, you know, there's there's a few out there, a handful out there that are really good that investors can look at. Um, but generally speaking, it's a great way to have some of your portfolio in a more secure and highly leveraged uh, sector of the market. But they do generally trade for higher premiums. Some, some of those advantages are already priced in. The, to add to your point, so the smaller royalty companies, they tend to get bought. So the ones that have that just started going public and they have a few royalties that are cash flow or about to go cash flow, the medium sized ones or the larger ones tend to want to buy them before. I mean, look at what Great Bear Royalty, that was a spinoff. And then they got bought by Royal Gold um, way before the yeah. mine even came into production. The mines, I think, what are they? Is, is Great Bear at feasibility stage? Oh, I don't know where they have it right now, or where Ken Ross has it, but, you know, they sold that free resource, so it, it broke a lot of the rules or a lot of the standards in the industry. And and I personally, as a shareholder, I was disappointed that that royalty uh, was sold because it was, in my mind, a long-term annuity that would pay off for many years in the future. But Regardless, that that deal was worked by management almost perfectly uh, at every step of the way. And uh, it, it was just a beautiful thing for everybody involved. Yeah, I think Royal Gold got a lot of growth there, a lot of future growth there. Uh, it's not going to happen in the next couple of years. I mean, a lot of people are criticizing them. Oh, they paid $150 million cash for that royalty. Well, when, once it starts cash flowing, I mean, that they might get a payback period very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how the number is going to work because we don't have any economics on the the deposit as yet. You know, I don't even have a resources I know as far as I know on the project yet. But uh, but yeah, I think uh, everybody's going to make money off of that. One of the things about the royalty business too, and this involves the juniors that most people don't understand, is that the current metals prices, Brian, if the junior gets funding and starts doing exploration drilling. The royalty companies own royalties on these large land packages. So when the junior starts um, actually raising funds to do drilling, I mean, these are basically these royalties that the royalty companies own on the large land packages. Would you consider them call options that don't expire? Uh, yeah, I mean, and and you can track that. There are a number of ways to track that and see where the royalties are. There are royalties that will kill the economics for a project, um, but they aren't too common. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, you know, great for the royalty holders in those cases. Are we at gold and copper prices now? Cause uh, there's not a lot of primary silver deposits left. So it's not really worth using, uh, the silver price right now. Cause silver is a byproduct, like you said earlier in the interview, are we at gold and copper prices where a lot of these juniors can actually go and raise 10, 15, $20 million and do a full drill program right now? Uh, not yet. I would say, but, you know, check in in a, about a month. If if gold demonstrates and silver demonstrate this kind of upside momentum, um, I think this market's really going, going to heat up. Um, yeah, you know, not quite yet, but you also have to uh, balance that against, you know, dilution. So I hope that some of these companies that could raise that kind of money wait until they have some significant share price appreciation before they do that. Well, I mean, the junior has to dilute eventually, right? If they're going to build a mine, unless they decide that once they find a deposit, they just what they kind of do an EMX royalty model where they keep a royalty and then they just sell the deposit to a senior. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to figure out how a junior can avoid dilution, but eventually if they're going to build the mine, they're going to have to do some type of dilution. Yeah, they can't really avoid dilution, but it's the degree of dilution. Um, and, and, and it's just what, however, the, it's whatever the market will allow you and all that, however, the, the numbers will tumble. In some cases, it's better to dilute down to a royalty or an undiluted, say, 10 percent interest in the project rather than contribute to build it. But it, it depends on the project. If you're if a junior is facing a development of a porphyry copper gold project then you know that's going to have huge capex and they they would probably be better diluting down to whatever their deal says they would dilute to uh and or the the major will just buy them out at, at a premium but um it, it is some project 
dependent. Um, and you just have to see how the numbers tumble. Yeah, I think even Mag Silver, and they had arguably the best silver deposit found in the last like 10, 15, 20 years, because what that's 400, it was 400 grams per ton silver, and it was going to run for decades. And their partner was Fresno. I think even they had a large CapEx bill. So they even had to do some dilution in what their interest is 30 or 40% of the one set BO mine. Yeah, it it depends on com- from company to company. Uh, and it, they all are going to have to face some sort of dilution. It's just a matter of how much. I think the only one that got away with it was was EMX royalty, right? Because they were a prospect generator. So that when they found mines, right, they just keep a royalty and then they'd sell the deposit to an, a developer then. So that this way, then they uh, avoided the CapEx bill. Yeah, uh, it is a royalty company. Um, so that is what they do. It's, it is more of a prospect generator royalty company. It actually goes out, gets land, uh, but doesn't develop it much other than trying to show the value to the market and then uh, trades it for royalty, in, in some cases equity, in the junior. And uh, it's worked out very well for them. It's one of the best run companies out there. Yeah, they say um, publicly their business model is not a pure royalty model. They say they're a hybrid. So they kind of yeah. they started off, if I remember correctly, many years ago as more of a prospect generator. But then they kept the royalties, and the royalties started cash flowing. So then they adapted to more of a hybrid model. Yep, yep. They uh, and and you know, a prospect generator, if they are successful, ends up being uh, quite often a royalty company, where you know, without that necessarily being their intent. So in terms of new mines that are funded and under construction now, do you think that Greenstone is the best new mine that's coming online right now? Or do you think there's better mines in Canada in safer countries? Um, I really don't have what I would consider to be a very knowledgeable opinion on that, because I do focus so much more on the exploration and development and not really the big miners as much. So I I really wouldn't hazard an, an opinion on that. Okay, that's fair enough, because uh, that one's in Canada, and it's uh, almost up to, it's scaling up right now. They just did first gold pour back in May. So over the next couple quarters, it's going to achieve commercial production or the nameplate capacity production. Mm-hmm. Could be uh, well below $1,000 an ounce. So that um, we'll see if they hit the numbers, because that's always the issue with mining, right? Is the company says that the costs are going to be this, and then you go back and look up um well, they announced the press release and then the costs are not what the company says. So what they say and what they do are normally two different things. Yeah, that particular point in, you know, the famous Lausanne curve right before production is can be one of the most rewarding. But with that potential comes greater risk because hiccups getting into production are quite, quite frequent. And uh, so, you know, you, you you just don't know. You don't know. But if they do get into production, they, they you can be rewarded significantly. Um, it's just that there are quite often issues, and we've seen some of the more spectacular failures over the years. Does your newsletter specifically target like parts of the Lasagne curve for for investment? Because I know some of the other uh, newsletters, like uh, Lobo Tigre and some of the others, they specifically target parts of the Lasagne curve for the newsletter. Yeah, Lobo does target that kind of pre-production area, uh, which, as I say, can be very rewarding, can work out very well. But when there are failures, they can be spectacular, as we've seen, uh, like for pure gold. Now, yes, I am more in the uh, discovery in early stage development camp. Uh, Typically, I like the, the companies that have that really explosive upside potential, the 10 bagger potential. And we've been able to find a bunch of them over the years. Uh, that said, I think we're in a, a place right now in the junior market where companies that have large scale gold or silver deposits, in some cases when they've advanced enough to have economic studies done on them, are selling for about a quarter or less of what they would sell in just a normal market environment. And therefore they offer four to five bagger potential with a lot less risk than you would normally get, uh, you know, investing in companies that, that offer that kind of potential. So 
those are some good opportunities right now, I think, at this stage in the market. Are you saying that there's about a 75% discount to net asset value for like the mine plan, the feasibility study for some of these potential miners? Well, maybe not at the feasibility study, but if you look at companies like Banyan Gold with 7 million ounces, um, and of course in the Yukon now, so it's it has uh, taken a bit of a haircut recently. Um, you look at Vizsla Silver, these are deposits that are going to be mines down the road at some point. And they're valued at, you know, in some cases, well, I believe that uh, Banyan's roll under $10 an ounce when a sale of a deposit uh, in a typical market is usually going to happen at $100 to $150 an ounce, uh, especially for a large scale deposit that has a lot of upside potential. Those are the kinds of opportunities you have right now. As we wrap up here, I want to ask your ask you about your thoughts on long term copper supply and demand and the copper price because that also affects gold and silver supply. As gold can be a byproduct of a copper mine, so can silver. Do you think that we're going to need a lot more copper supply going forward for next generation technology, especially like these data centers, artificial intelligence, electrification, and electric vehicles? Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, the copper story, it, it's really fascinating to me that at the same time, we have a tremendous uh, monetary argument for gold. Uh, we have a tremendous, uh, tr another tremendously bullish environment for copper and other base metals, and they're completely independent of each other. So, yeah, um, we're going to need lots of copper. There may be 40 the 50 known copper deposits out there that are, you know, 500 million tons or larger. If to achieve the goals that they currently have for electrification, um, each, every one of those deposits is going to have to be developed. It's not a matter of this one or that one. It's a matter of all of them will be needed. That said, there are, big deposits among those that will may never be developed uh, for some reason, um, political, you know, geopolitical or, or other reasons that don't have to do with economics. So that only exacerbates the supply demand strain that we're seeing, uh, which drives prices ever higher. So yeah, copper is, I think, a set it and forget it story. I don't think it has the kind of excitement that the gold stories do. Uh, because a junior in the copper market typically has to take that minority interest in a large scale deposit. So it doesn't get as much of the torque as a uh, as a gold discovery does. Uh, there are exceptions, of course, to every rule. You, you've got Philo out there that because of its relationship, because it's a Lund Lundin company, uh, they had the wherewithal to to raise money and drill it off themselves. Uh, but generally speaking, it's not as explosive of a sector as the gold sector is. But it is one of the the uh, I think one of the stories out there in the metals markets that are uh, you can be most confident in over the long term. Don't look at it, you know, as something that's going to take off over the next month or two or even year. But you know, buy some good stories now and and. A few years down the road, you're probably going to be very glad you did. There's also looking at potential supply shortages by the mid 2030s if the all the new technologies play out the way thing uh, people are projecting. And the big technology companies and governments are just planning absolutely enormous capital expenditure for these next generation data centers, the amount of electricity usage. The other part of it <clears throat> is the funding of these mines. I mean, the average person doesn't understand this probably. But a medium-sized copper mine is not very big. It's the capital expenditure. It's a billion dollars or more to build a medium-sized copper mine. So if you're a, a senior or a mid-tier royalty and streaming company, you can go in there and provide a good slice of the funding there to help this copper mine get built. And you're looking at a gold, a silver, or a platinum group metal uh, uh, byproducts of uh, stream supply. Yeah. And the, the CapEx involved in bringing big copper projects and the time involved. Uh, only mean that those those price pressures are going to be that much greater because supply can't rapidly respond to the price pressure, the price signals. Um, so it's a great place to be, really, if you 
um, if you can find some of the better junior copper uh, companies out there and really even some of the majors. Yeah, I agree. Long term for the copper price. I mean, I, the copper miners, if you go back and look at the copper miners ETF charts, I mean, up until the last six months, they've drastically underperformed the rise in the copper price. So it's a similar story with the gold miners versus the gold price that the gold miners ETF, what the GDX has drastically underperformed the gold price since uh, 2010. It's a similar story for a lot of these commodities. Yeah, yeah. Uh... A lot of the big miners. And, you know, if you go back 20 years and you see that the share prices of Barrick or Newmont are about the same as they were decades ago, you realize that these are not growth companies. You know, they, these are cyclical companies. They are tools that you use to leverage metals prices uh, when you feel that the macro picture is turned in the favor. You know, when you're you're playing that upside of, of the commodity cycle. That's when they really kick in and that's when they they provide outsized gains. And uh, that's where we are right now, frankly. Well, the point you just brought up about the share price underperformance of Barrick Gold and Newmont Mining for the last like 20 years versus the metals price. I mean, I think that shows that the managements uh, who are running these businesses, they either do bad acquisitions or they cannot control costs consistently. So for a brief period of time, I don't know, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, they can maintain the costs and free cash flow and stuff like that. You have a window there as a trader, but long-term these businesses, like they just have to deal with falling ore grades, rising input costs, uh, management's gonna go do go and do a bad deal. I mean, um, I, I don't know how you feel about Barrick Gold and Newmont, Mon Newmont Mining who are supposed to be primary gold producers and they want to go and buy copper mines now <laughs> well yeah and that's one way to get gold too but but again the copper story i can't really blame them being producers the copper story is really strong i think copper is going to double over the next few years and uh you know these pressures are only going to grow um so yeah i, I don't really blame them for doing that but at least uh, this current crop of producers are not overly hedging their production, particularly in gold, and they're preserving their uh, their function as a way to leverage metals prices. Uh, there's no reason for other than preserving their jobs that a, a big miner should hedge a significant portion of their production. Now, sometimes they have to do that to build a project, but that's accretive. If you're simply trying to lock in uh, current prices, uh, you're not a bet on higher prices. And, and I think most of the management teams out there have realized that. Uh, and we've had a big shift in the market from the late 90s when, when they were hedging, particularly Barrick. Now, we'll see, you know, once we get over $3,000 an ounce, we'll see what those miners do. But if they start hedging, then I think they're going to lose a lot of their following very quickly. Yeah, I agree. And Barrick also, to add your points there, I think Barrick had to increase their share count by 300% to buy a lot of those hedges back. So they had to do an enormous amount of equity, equity dilution to go and pay off those hedges so they weren't still hedged at much lower gold prices. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, Mark Bristow, I, I like him. I think he's a great manager. I don't think he's going to make the same mistakes that previous Barrick management has made. Uh, and he's a bit of a gold bug, too. So I, I like that about him. But do you still think that the industry has to deal with falling ore grades and and uh, it's uh, the difficulties then of yeah, maintaining absolutely. of maintaining profit margins and preventing costs from rising? Because I just see that as a I don't think that problem's going away, unfortunately, for the industry. No, it is. It, it, it is a problem. It's going to provides uh, supply strains for copper in particular. Um, I don't think it's as big of an issue for gold because I don't think that supply demand really drives the gold market again that much. In fact, I think the monetary issues out there are going to drive the gold price to the extent that it's going to overwhelm those uh, lower ore grades and other physical characteristics, physical constraints on gold production uh, because price solves everything eventually and higher prices will bring forward a uh, greater supply. I don't think it's going to bring forward enough supply to dampen the price in this case because the monetary issues are what really drives gold and 
Uh, there's just so much currency being created today that the gold price has a lot of of uh, a lot of room to make it up. Yeah, I agree with your point there about how copper and silver, the industrial component, those metals, they have uh, supply problems, also permitting with the open pit mines uh, with their industrial demand more than gold. But the the other one, the two industrial metals, the platinum group metals, platinum and palladium, I mean, they're so cheap now. They're cheap and hated. A lot of the South African platinum miners, I mean, BHP Billiton didn't want those businesses uh, the, the electricity costs in South Africa, where a lot of that stuff's being produced, there the miners are running at losses. That, as a contrarian to me, looks like good risk reward. There, like how much uh, can those metals prices stay flat or lower when the mining costs are so high? So, I, I think we're going to have a rally in the next year or two, and potential shortages if the platinum and palladium, excuse me, if the platinum and palladium price don't start to rally. Yeah, I, I think they're going to be pulled by gold and silver to some extent, but I don't really view platinum and palladium as precious metals any longer or monetary metals. I think they're industrial metals. Um, and, and that will primarily drive their prices. I think silver has lost some of its monetary allure over the last uh, couple of decades, but it is still the other uh, monetary metal. It's still the poor man's gold. And because of that, I think it will leverage gold in this uh, bull market because this bull market is based on those monetary concerns. Yep. And I'm thinking we're seeing a steady case of demand here with central banks for gold. There's dollar cost averaging <clears throat> by the non-G7 central banks. And um, the main uh, diversion here of the reserves, the foreign central banks outside the G7, they are not accumulating U.S. Treasuries at anywhere near the pace they did in the past. They're, they're dollar cost averaging gold tonnage instead. I think that's the main point. But really, as Brian detailed since March, the huge spike in, in demand increase has been retail investors in China, India, Japan, Korea, Thailand, Vietnam. I don't think anyone saw that coming. I think a lot of it has to do with their currency weakness against the dollar. I mean, look at the Japanese yen right now and their Korean won against the dollar. Who would have thought that um, uh, timing wise that eventually the Japanese yen would start to break? And um, I think people in Japan for the first time in decades are starting to take a look at gold again. Yeah. And, you know, the, those currency fluctuations obviously have an effect. Um, they have an effect because the um, the dollar, you know, gold is priced in, in dollar terms and and it's generally believed and with some backing by the evidence that a uh, lower dollar means a higher gold price or helps the gold price rise. But we've seen a number of different things uh, happen in this market, really interesting things. You know, the, at least in the early stages of this bull run and last October, November, we saw gold rising along with a stronger dollar and along with rising treasury yields. And I think that was a sign, uh, kind of weirdly so, of some safe haven buying where the concerns were uh, with higher inflation and the concerns were with not just the return on your money in treasuries, but to some degree, the return of your money in U.S. treasuries. So it, there are exceptions to every rule. And I think that when you see gold rising, with a stronger dollar and with rising treasury yields, it's a sign of uh, a safe haven buying to some degree. And shockingly, the Asian price buyer, which usually uh, is price sensitive and does not want to chase the price higher, they're accumulating. I mean, I'm seeing articles coming out now about enormous demand out of Korea, South Korea. Uh, they're buying physical gold in a vending machine. Uh, there's long lines for physical gold, also not just in mainland China, but also in Thailand and Vietnam. So these are places where we weren't expecting big demand increases. And now we're starting to see institutional investors, pension funds in those countries that did not have gold allocation. They're starting to announce that they're going to allocate to gold too. Yep, that's precisely uh, correct. It is a much broader you know, we talk about the, the two main drivers being central bank demand and Chinese domestic demand in the early stages of this bull market. But it really is fairly broad based and getting more uh, broad based with, with seemingly every day because we are seeing a lot of domestic demand in other Asian countries. And now 
I think the Western investors are ready to join the party. Well, especially if the gold price stays at these levels, right? Because the fund managers are going to say, well, what's in a bull market right now? And the gold price is relatively high, especially if those tech stocks start to not perform well lately. <laughs> yeah. You know, there are some friends of mine in the industry who think that that's a prerequisite for a big, rollicking, roaring metals market that we have a concurrent bear market in U.S. equities. And I don't think that's the case. I think it may have been the case in previous bull runs in gold, but now everything is so dependent upon central bank liquidity that I think when we turn to the uh, uh, the easier side of the cycle, the, the more accommodative side of monetary policy, it floats all the markets higher. And because it's money itself that is getting cheaper, Every time this happens, I think gold and silver perform uh, especially well in those environments. Well, I think we're starting to see the other G7 central banks start to cut rates and start to do what um, letting inflation run hot. That's adding net liquidity to their uh, to uh, asset markets and the capital is coming here to the U.S. But I mean, we're starting to see with the relatively strong dollar and the Fed keeping interest rates at these levels before cutting, we're starting to see Chinese banks have cracks. We're starting to see Japanese banks have cracks and the commercial real estate bubble in the U.S. It will hurt the regional banks. We haven't seen a lot of failures yet, but um, the Fed did create the BTFP and that delayed things out for a while. Yep, it's a it's a good environment going forward, I think, for for the metals and and now, as I said, for the miners as well. Exactly. And uh, in uh, other countries, when banks start to fail, I mean, people start researching how to how to take money out of the system, gold, silver, Bitcoin, those seem to be the three main ones that uh, attract uh, capital. And, and they will continue to be so, I think, and especially in Asian countries, the affinity toward gold and silver will put them at an advantage among the options. Well, Brian, I really enjoyed our discussion today, your wealth of information on gold, silver, and gold stocks. If my listeners want to take a look at your newsletter or check out the New Orleans Investment Conference, how did they do so? Well, they can go to goldnewsletter.com. We have a free report, The Investor's Guide to Gold and Silver, a 40-page objective report. It's not a sales document that you can download for free at goldnewsletter.com. Also, they can go to neworleansconference.com to learn about this year's big gala 50th anniversary New Orleans Investment Conference. It's being held November 20th to 23rd, a bit later this year, but that is the week before Thanksgiving week. So it doesn't really conflict with any of your Thanksgiving plans. Uh, and it's going to be a, a, a tremendous event this year, one that I, every serious investor, I think, should attend. And for listeners out there who have not been to New Orleans, New Orleans has great food. It's definitely a fun vacation. Yep, I would say so. I uh, And we bring a lot of that food, great food, into the event. You get a real taste of New Orleans ambiance and culture and food. At our event, we, we put out a, a pretty lavish spread for our attendees. I remember I last visited New Orleans in, I think, 2010 or 11, and your restaurants there were doing sous vide way ahead of all the other American restaurants. Uh, we are on the cutting edge, for sure. And, um, you know, the, you it's a, a bad restaurant does not last long in New Orleans. It, it really doesn't. The competition is just too fierce, and the, uh, the audience is too sophisticated. So it's got to be good if it's been around for a while. Uh, plus, no bland food. <laughs> nope, not at all. 